uh, last Sunday I said something that probably uh, probably um, jarred some people. Uh, I said um, uh, righteousness is not given to you as a, a badge of honor because you live right. Then I said nobody can live right, which is correct. Your righteousness and my righteousness is not earned. No one can earn righteousness. No one. And when you live right and people uh, give you accolades because you live right, God is actually not glorified. You are glorified. Because you actually now can say to God, I performed right. I ought to be called righteous. Now, righteousness is a gift. And when, because you can't live right, but he can. And in him, you live. And in him, you move. And in him, you and I have our beings. But the righteousness that we have is not of the law, which means you can't earn it by behaving well. It is a gift that is given to us by Jesus Christ. So our righteousness is imputed to us by virtue of what he's done. And when we live in him, we are made righteous. Now, when you understand that, you actually live right. Are you okay? You'll actually want to do what he wants to do and you'll actually live right but you're not given a badge of honor to say that now you're righteous because you live right nobody can do that otherwise the cross is absolutely canceled and the reason for the cross is because no one can live right but the cross makes us righteous in him he took our sin fire a second Second uh, Corinthians 5.21, God made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Do you get that? So Paul had the same frustration when Paul uh, wrote uh, Romans chapter 7. How many read Romans chapter 7? And he said, I want to do right, but I end up doing the wrong thing. And yet I want to do right. What's that? That's the law. Now, I go to uh, different places in the, in the world and just talking, okay? Uh, and there are countries where the religious spirit is so strong that people will get on a cross and they can actually get crucified. And after the crucifixion, they go to the to the ho uh, hotel, the hospital, and get their wounds patched up. But they actually get on the cross, and they actually get crucified. What is that? That is the flesh trying to get right, and he can't do it. That is the flesh trying to earn righteousness and saying to God, "God, I I'm no, no, he, he can't do it." Righteousness. Is given to you as a gift. And that's what we shared last week from Romans chapter 5. And I can read it to you again. Chapter 5 and verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reign through the one. One man's offense death reign through through the generations. The wages of sin is death. Much more. Much more. Everyone say much more. <laughs> much more those who receive. Abundance of grace. And of the gift of righteousness. Will reign in life through one Jesus Christ. So as much as death reigned by the offense. Of this one man. We can reign in life by the gift of righteousness and the abundance of grace given by this one. You understand it? 
Because many Christians struggle, struggle. You hear some of the prayers of some of the Christians, you think, when are they going to get saved? They're always trying to earn something. You don't earn something. You know that it's been given and you rejoice in that freedom. Freedom reigns in, or did you just sing a, a line? Freedom reigns in this place. Why? Because we understand it's not us, it's him. Hallelujah. So that's in Romans chapter 5. If you look at Romans chapter 4. Verse 13. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Not earned, received. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. If you can earn righteousness, the promise is not to you. If you can earn your righteousness by trying to live right or by living right, the promise of Christ is not for you. Why? Because you've done what he came to do. Are you okay? Because the law brings about wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. And then this is the verse I wanted to read to you. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace. It's of faith. Why is it of faith? Because it, it is grace. And the only way you receive grace and receive righteousness is by faith. You just have to accept it, that Christ has done it. And when he said it is finished, it's actually finished. And so when you understand that, that you're going to live and reign in life through what he's done and in him and through him. Hallelujah. In him we live. In him we move and in him we have our being because it's from him and of him and to him are all things. Part of the reason why sometimes I, there are certain teachings that I don't agree with. When it says it's of him and through him and to me. That sounds good, and it is good. But everything must be from him, to me, through me, and back to him. Everything must go back to him, the glory. So when you receive righteousness, because it's his gift, the glory actually goes back to him. But if you can earn it, the glory go, don't go back to me, it goes to you. Are you all right? And the reason it's the righteousness of faith is because it might be by grace. Talk to me. I'm just trying to explain something. And we said that last week in the, the, the first few verses of Romans chapter 5. It says you're standing on grace and you're accessing grace. Hell, how can you stand? I mean... <laughs> You're standing in the sea trying to get the sea. Are you all right? That is abundance of grace. You're standing on grace and accessing grace. And Paul and God, when God said, uh, when Paul prayed and God said, no. God said, I'm not going to answer your prayer. But every time that happens, my grace will be sufficient 
So the grace of God is sufficient for everything that we go through. Hallelujah. Amen. Are you okay? Praise the Lord. God is a good God. God is good. We, we shared about the kingdom because I wanted to prelude that, use that as a prelude to talking about uh, our small groups. And uh, we said that the power of the kingdom is in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And the best place for that to practice understanding that anointing is in a small group. When you come to a service like this, you come to a celebration service and you may see certain things and get excited about that. But the best place for that anointing to be practiced and to see that anointing flow is in a small group. Uh, many times the anointing is vested on whoever does the ministry. But we said last week that God calls the whole church the anointed. He calls the leader like Moses the anointed. Calls a king like David the anointed. But he also calls his whole people the anointed. So the anointing is vested on a person as we said last week, the anointing functions by gifts. So we said today regarding Christine, Christine is a gift to us. Ben is a gift to us. And the anointing as pastors are not given by the church, they're given by God. We can't make anybody a pastor. We just recognize the gifting on their lives but it's God that releases the anointing and separate them to function in an office or a function in the church. But it comes by the anointing. But when you're in a small group and you sense the anointing on the people in that small group, it's really, really fantastic for you to learn and imbibe of the anointing and the understanding that you find in a small group, because in a small group, you can nut things out. You can ask questions. You can provoke one another. Here, you don't provoke one another. If you disrupt the service, you get taken out. <laughs> and there's a couple of people that disrupted the service in the last few months, and they get taken out. Why? Because it's not a free for all when you come to the church, but in a small group, you learn you are in a situation, a fail-safe situation, that even if you make a mistake, people love you and you're able to learn because the setting is great. It's safe. So when we say get to a small group, as we said last week, the reason we say it, and it seems like a suggestion, I'm not suggesting. The reason it appears to be a suggestion is because we need to get into your, your will. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And not even God can get into your will. You have to allow him to get into your will. And we said last week that on earth, on this planet, hallelujah, the will of God is weak. Your will is stronger than God's will. Whatever you want to do on the planet, you can do. God won't force it on you, won't force his will on you. Whatever you want to do, you want to go steal a store, you want to go rob a car, you want to go and do something stupid, God can't stop you. Why? Because God can't force you. You are sovereign over your own will. And so when we say get into a small group, we are not uh, 
The reason it appears to be a suggestion is I can't force you to get into one. But if you are willing to understand and you're willing to learn, because where two agree on earth, it's done for them in heaven. Hallelujah. For where two or three are gathered together in his name, he comes. Just two or three gathered in his name. He turns up and moves the authority of his government into where two or three are gathered together in his name. Hallelujah. It's been very hard to try and cast vision for our church in the last two years because of COVID. And we, this is the first um, paper tea we're going to have for the year. Is it right? This is our first paper tea for this year. We've tried because we did not know if we have a paper tea, those that have come that are not vaccinated, those that have come that are vaccinated, or we should have a, a Zoom thing or whatever. It was difficult to try and navigate. So this coming weekend is our first paper tea for those that are in the leadership of the church and those that are uh, uh, budding leaders and normally we will do that in the we will cast vision in the in the, the to the leadership of the church before before we we say anything to the church so it's been difficult to try and engage everybody because we haven't been able to be in a space where we cast vision so I thought I'd just do it from here are you all right? Yeah. So whether you're visiting or, or you're a member of the church, you got it. The best place to make disciples is in a small setting. You can't mature people in a crowd. And we share that. People are matured sometimes, matured alone. The Abrahams, the Moses, the Davids. All those people in engaging God and encountering God, God began to minister to them and they understand God because of uh, sometimes the loneliness of walking, just walking them and God. And God is not lost. God wants us to find him. If you end up going to hell, it's not God's fault. God has already paid the price. And the best place to disciple people so that they can understand what their faith is all about is in a small setting. There are people who want to come and experience God in a crowd like this. They get angry at the church and then they leave. But if they belong to a small group, they find a family God sets the solitary in families. They find brothers and sisters. They find a mom and a dad that they can ring when things are not going well. They say, can you help me with this? Hallelujah. Are you okay? I don't mind. I don't think you'll mind. I'll just share it with you. I won't mention his name because, uh, but he rang me and said, oh, my son, his son has uh, never been a church goer, but uh, but it had demonic visitation. <laughs> he rang his dad and said, dad, I think this thing is real. And he said, so what did he do? I said, in the name of Jesus, get out of my house. And what happened? He did, but I'm still afraid. <laughs> now, he's not even walking with God. But he heard it from his parents, understood it from his parents, and in the moment of crisis, he reached back to what his parents said. And he said, in the name of Jesus Christ, get out of my house. Because if the devil's going to attack you, he'll start there. And if you don't know what to do. Are you okay? So the best place to 
disciple and mature people is in a small setting. And then when they go on, they understand maturity by just walking with God. Like the Abrahams. God called him alone. Like the Moses who discovered God. Like the Davids. Like the Elijahs. Like the Elishas. Like the Jeremiahs. And the Nehemiahs. Mm. <laughs> Nehemiah. Nehemiah is only Nehi. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna sanctify the pulpit. <laughs> the best place to train people for ministry is in a small setting. You instruct them and you tell them this is what you do. But the best place to train them. Now, the Bible says God has given us pastors, uh, evangelists, teachers, apostles, and prophets. For the perfecting of the saints, so the saints can do the ministry. It's not the leadership, it's not the pastors that do the ministry. It's the saints that do the ministry. My job is to engage the saints and train the saints. Don't ring me if a demon turns up in your house. You're supposed to do it yourself. And if you learn that, you learn that well in a small setting so that when things don't go well, you know that you've got abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness and you can reign in life. You don't have to be overcome. We are more than conquerors. We, we overcome. And the best place to train people to live overcoming lives is in a small setting. The best place to train your children is in a, at home. I know that Martin and Tash are both teachers. But the teacher is not the parent of your child. Don't transfer that responsibility to the teachers, even though we do. And now the government wants to take that responsibility from your hands to them. They are saying we are better parents than you, and we will do. And if you don't do what we tell your kids to do, we are going to lock you up because you broke the law. And the church said, okay, you can take... Hello? I tell you a story? I better tell you this story and then I'll finish with my time. <laughs> uh, a, a young couple, you know, they, they went to church and they were encouraged to get to church and get to a small group. And, and they said, uh, we're going to get to church as soon as the baby is born. So when the baby was born, they said, uh, uh, you must think that we are terrible, but we can't bring the baby because the baby makes a lot of noise. Uh, we'll wait until the baby grows up a little bit, and then we will come to church. At three years old, they bring the baby to church. The baby runs around, and that was fine because three-year-olds normally run around. And they don't know that this is a church. So... Three-year-old, three-year-old. When I was a child, I behave as a child. All right. Don't get the three-year-old to behave like you. All right. And then they said, uh, sorry, we are not coming to church because Julie is running around all over the place. We'll wait. And then when Julie was 11, now just telling you the story. All right. When Julie was 11, they went to church. And Julie came back and said, I don't like church. So they said, sorry, we can't come to church anymore because Julie don't like church. Now, 
about another seven years later, which was only in her mid-teens, late teens, Julie got married. And then they said, uh, can somebody from church help Julie? The guy she married, they're terrible, those young people. And when Julie was 24, they said, finally, Julie is married now to a man that will meet her needs. That's a third marriage now. And I hope that it lasts. Now, that story I'm telling you is a story that is true. But can you imagine if people keep on neglecting what the church gets engaged in? How do you expect your child to grow up and have an understanding of what God is like? So that young man ringing his dad up, saying, can somebody come pray over the house? And he said, what happened? We got some demonic visitation, the kids are scared. And, and I, he said, what did he do? I said, I, got, I just remember what you do. So I said, in the name of Jesus, get out of my house. And the thing left. He said, but I'm still scared. Can you get somebody to come and pray? The best place to engage in spiritual matters. You go back to the beginning of the church. The first century church was not actually in a building. It was in houses. Corinthian church was in houses. Every now and again, when they find a temple, they will meet in the temple, like the temple in Jerusalem. But it's primarily the life of flowing anointing of the church was small, small groups. And if you can engage in that area, it'll be fantastic. Praise the Lord. I've got a whole lot more to share. I can share it uh, another time. Are you okay? But uh, let me pray for us. Father, we thank you that you have not hidden yourself from us. You made yourself known and you reveal yourself to us through the person of Jesus Christ. And I pray, Father, right now that your hand rests upon your people, those that are watching and those that are here. Pray for those that may not know you, those who have, may have may be seeing this uh, service but have walked away from you. And Father, you will minister to them and touch their lives. Let me pause the prayer for a moment. If you're here today, you've never made Christ the Lord of your life. Can you lift your hand so I can see? God bless you. Anybody else? If you are watching from home and you've never made Christ the Lord of your life, or maybe you have made Christ the Lord of your life, but you're not walking with him, can you respond to this? Hallelujah. Can you stand, sweetheart? going to pray a prayer. I want you to follow me in the prayer. This is a prayer of acceptance where you accept Christ as Lord of your life. You, you pray it out loud so you can hear your own voice. The church will help you. All right. Stand with her. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord, that you died on the cross for me. I come to you today. I recognize that I am a sinner and need your forgiveness. I open my heart to you. And ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart. Cleanse me from my sin. Wash me with your blood. Today, dear God, I accept you 
by faith into my life to be the Lord and King of my life, be Savior of my soul. I give you my life today. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I am yours and you are mine. I bless your name. Thank you, Lord. I'm now yours. I'm saved. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, I pray, I pray for this dear one, Lord God, today. I pray your blessing upon her life. I pray, dear God, for those that may have prayed that prayer from home, that, Lord, that your hand reach out and touch them. And, Lord, thank you, Lord God, that you will not cast us out, that you accept us for who we are. You cleanse us and cause us to live for you. Lord, we bless this dear one today. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. In Jesus' name, and everyone say, Amen. Amen. Amen.